Workshop 4 for Cells and Elgonels is going to be all about experimental design and this is going to prepare you for the practical work. So Workshop 4 is about experimental design and then next week we're going to be in the lab. So on Monday and Tuesday you're going to be introduced to some new techniques, you'll have the opportunity to practice them. And then on Friday you're going to collect your own data. So uh, between the practicals you're going to have to design your own experiment including controls and replicants that can be analysed using the stats that you learnt in the skill module. Then uh, on the Friday, as I say, you're going to collect your data and then the final workshop um, will be about how scientists present experimental data uh, in scientific papers uh, because you're going to have to write a lab report over the Christmas break. So in order to do this, we're going to have to think a little bit about how we design really robust experiments so that we can genuinely test a hypothesis. So here's a hypothesis that we could design an experiment to test. So uh, we could have an, a hypothesis that said drug X, uh, so a new drug, will increase the rate of apoptosis in HeLa cells. So those are those uh, human cancer cells that we discussed in the lectures. So we'd set up an experiment to do this. So we might have uh, an experiment to measure the percentage of cells undergoing apoptosis. And then we'd have untreated cells, uh, and then we give the cells the drug uh, and look for the difference. So these two things we can say are our two variables. So we have our independent variable, which is the thing that we're actively controlling in the experiment. And then our dependent, or sometimes called the response variable, is the thing that changes as a result of our independent variable. So we set up by saying there's going to be a, a relationship between an independent and a dependent variable. So we can then do the experiment to try and test the hypothesis. So we know that in any experiment we need to have a comparison group, um, so we'd have some sort of control. So in this case, um, we might have untreated cells would represent our negative control. So the control is something where we know what's going to happen. So in the negative uh, control, uh, basically um, we should know exactly how the cells are going to respond. Uh, and then this is our treatment, uh, is the drug uh, that we can do a comparison with. So in this case, we can see uh, that there is a higher rate of cells undergoing apoptosis in the presence of the drug. But we don't know really at the moment what the strength of that effect is and whether that effect is statistically significant. So you should know from the uh, skills lectures that we need to include uh, multiple measurements, which we call replicates in our experiments. So rather than just measuring things once, uh, in this case, if we measure each one uh, 10 times, then we can be calculating uh, a mean uh, represented by the height of this bar and some kind of uh, measure of the variation. So it might be standard deviation. So. Um, so we've now got a more robust experiment uh, in that we've got multiple uh, measurements, we've got replicates in there, so we could then um, do a t-test between those two treatments, for example. However, at the moment, this isn't uh, the best experiment that we could design because uh, what we've actually done is to add two different things to the experiment. So we've uh, introduced our drug X, but we've also introduced some methanol. So let's imagine that this drug was only soluble um, in methanol. Um, so you've got to add uh, the methanol uh, in the system as well, um, which means that there's two different things that are going in there. So we need a better control than just untreated cells in this case. So a better negative control than just untreated cells would to be have a solvent control or a, neg a negative control whereby we add the methanol uh, to see what effect that has on the cells uh, and then that is the best direct comparison uh, with our drug treatment. So we can see if we do that then actually there's a slightly higher rate um, of apoptosis in our methanol treated cells. So now we'd actually want to be doing our t-test between uh, our treatment and this because this is a closer match um, um, for our drug treatment. So uh, the untreated control was useful, but this solvent control is a better control to be using in this case. However, we still re don't really uh, know uh, whether the uh, the new drug is a particularly strong drug or not. Uh, so what might be useful to do is to introduce uh, what's known as a positive control as well. So in this case, a positive control would be to add a known drug treatment. So a drug we already know affects apoptosis. So we can see how the resp cells respond to the known drug. And then now we can have a look uh, at the difference between our new drug here, so our treatment, and a known control. So that's a positive control, and that could be quite useful in uh, determining how strong a response is. 
The other thing that can make your experiment a better design, uh, particularly for this sort of pharmacology type experiment, is to introduce not just a single concentration of our drug, but to introduce a range of concentrations. Because uh, if we just didn't use one concentration, we might have guessed uh, what the concentration was and have got it wrong. So if we include a range of different concentrations, then we can see uh, the types of responses we get. So you can see from this that uh, designing a really good experiment, you might need multiple positive and negative controls in there. We might need to think about dose responses. Uh, so there's lots uh, to think about when designing a really good, robust experiment. So to get you thinking about this, we're going to ask you to read a paper before coming to this week's workshop. Uh, so we've picked out a paper for you uh, which describes the interactions uh, between Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, which is uh, it's a weed but it's very commonly used in plant genetic uh, research, and look at the interactions between that and a herbivore, uh, which is uh, the larva of a cabbage looper uh, moth. So uh, the paper is all about the interactions between those two organisms and the techniques they've used are relatively simple to understand. So we're going to use this as a way of discussing how scientific papers are written, how they're put together and how you can look at the features of experimental design. So to help you understand the paper, I'm going to introduce a few bits of terminology that you might find helpful. So the paper is all about circadian rhythms. So uh, circadian rhythms, uh, we talked a bit about it in the lectures, but those are uh, rhythms that arise from an internal or endogenous oscillator. And the way that you usually measure circadian rhythms is to set up a time course experiment. So here we've got a, um, some, uh, an organism, it could be a plant, it could be a mouse, it could be a human, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we've subjected them to different light regimes. So to start off with, um, we uh, subject our organism uh, to light-dark cycles. So uh, we set up rhythms of light and dark, um, and that's what we refer to as entrainment. So we're setting up uh, some sort of rhythm there, and then if we measure our biological process, then we can see uh, that the rhythm fluctuates uh, on a 24-hour basis. But then the test to see if uh, something is genuinely a circadian rhythm uh, is to set up uh, what's called a free run. So basically, um, rather than having in light dark cycles, you put your organism into continuous light, which we've done for the second half of this experiment. And that allows you to tell the difference between a circadian rhythm, which is able to persist even if the lights have been switched on permanently, and that's different to a, a, a rhythm that's purely diurnal. So a diurnal rhythm would be a direct response to light in the light-dark cycles, but then there'd be no rhythmic response later on. So that's our formal test for whether something is a circadian rhythm or not. So, uh, so we start with entrainment, uh, so our light-dark cycles usually, or it could be temperature cycles, and then we go into free run, into continuous light, in order to test what's going on. Um, so when we're in light-dark cycles, um, we can refer to uh, things obviously as day and night. That's fairly straightforward. When we go into free one, it can be helpful, and you'll see it in the paper, uh, where we've called things subjective day and subjective night. So that's where um, if the lights have been allowed to keep going, uh, then when it was expecting to be light, that's the subjective day. But when the organism was expecting it to be dark, that's what we call a subjective night. So uh, it, the lights are actually on, uh, but the organism might think, might be expecting it to be night time. And if you do these sorts of experiments, then you can define various different parameters uh, of the rhythm. So, for example, we can define uh, the circadian period, which is the time between two uh, peaks of the rhythm. So we should be expecting that to be roughly 24 hours. Uh, we can look at the amplitude of the rhythm, so that's basically the height of the oscillation. And we can also look at the phase, so the paper talks a lot about phase. So the phase is the time of peak relative to either dawn or subjective dawn. So uh, it might be that you're phased uh, to be four hours after dawn, for example, or you might be phased to be 16 hours after dawn or subjective dawn. So phase is the time of day um, that something peaks, period is the length of the oscillation, and the amplitude is the height of the oscillation. So learning to read scientific papers is an important part of your scientific training. It's going to be an important part of your degree, but it's quite challenging to get started with. So um, I've put onto Canvas a guide of how to read a scientific paper. 
Um, it's written by the uh, American Society for Plant Biology, uh, but it's pretty good and it, uh, it uh, relates to all papers. And that's got some really helpful guidance in there also about interpreting statistics. Um, and before the workshop, we want you to have a little bit of a think uh, about the paper. So we do need you to have read the paper before you turn up. Um, we want you to identify any other unfamiliar words. So I'm going to set up a Google form on Canvas that you can put in those words um, so that I can uh, provide you with definitions of those before the workshop. But then I want you to think about three questions um, in, the, uh, in the paper before you arrive. Okay, so the first one is just what is the hypothesis that is being tested? What are they fundamentally trying to find out? And that's both for the paper as a whole, but also for each of the individual experiments. Then for each individual experiment, uh, I want you to try and think about what are the dependent and what are the independent variables in each of those experiments. So what are the two things that they're actually relating to each other? And then the third thing to think about uh, is, again, for each of those experiments, is which controls have been used. So have they got positive controls? Have they got negative controls? Uh, what have they done there uh, to have a robust experimental design? So we'll talk about all of this stuff uh, on Friday, um, and I'll see you then.